Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Where do we grow from here? Because we've been through a couple, two years of, of struggles and turmoil and, and just a lot of changes in our world. And so I've been helping our church as well as you individually because you are the church to recalibrate and to remember what's most important in the Christian faith. And so this is our last message of the series. So if you're catching up today, if this is your first time visiting, I'm sorry, today, I wanna encourage you to go online on YouTube or um, on our website and to watch these sermons and, or the app. Uh, we talked about worshiping God. We talked about the importance of growing together, coming together as a body of Christ so we can grow. Uh, we talked about prayer, which was a powerful week on prayer. Last week, we discussed serving and giving, the hands and feet of doing work. Well, we're on the same type of subject today. We're going to talk about evangelism and discipleship. And Jesus called us to do something. He said, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. And so Calvary is working hard on being a disciple-making church. And let's hear, though, the heart of God. This is the part where I'm changing in my sermon. Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to be in verse 35. And the title of this portion of Scripture, it's not going to be on the screen, but um, if you have your Bibles, you can use it. 9, verse 35. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, it's plentiful, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest He's in charge of those fields. He's in charge of this world. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. We see Jesus goes to the lost. He doesn't wait for them to come to him, even though it happens both ways. He goes to the lost where they are, and he preaches the gospel in the kingdom of God. And we are learning from this scripture that we go where they are, that we have to go and make disciples and go where people are. And this scripture shows us God's heart for humanity. He's concerned for the lost because they're like sheep without a shepherd. And, and here's the thing. There are a lot of sheep without shepherds. There's, there's a lot of sheep, in other words, without God, though, most importantly. He wants to be their shepherd and there is a lot of people ready to come to the kingdom, but there's few workers, the Bible is saying here. And so what does he say to do? He says to pray for workers. New research just came out from Lifeway Research, and it says this. There's a lot of curiosity from Americans about the faith it says half Americans, 51%, say they're curious as to why some people are so devoted to their faith, including 60% of the religiously unaffiliated. They're curious why you're so devoted to your faith. Curiosity is also more likely among young adults. Those 18 to 34, 61%, and 35 through uh, 49, ages 35 through 49, which is 55%, they're curious of why you are so devoted to your faith. That's good news because it seems like it's a lot less than that. Amid this curiosity, however, most say their Christian friends don't often bring up their religious beliefs. Ooh. Six in 10, 60% Americans say many of their friends who claim to be Christians rarely talk about their faith, including 52% of the religiously unaffiliated. Wow. And then ready for this, most Americans, 61%, say the pandemic has not changed their interest in spiritual matters. For a third of Americans, however, COVID-19 has made them more interested. The harvest is ready, the workers are few. Let's take a moment and pray. Because it says, ask the Lord for the workers. Lord, 
today, speak to us because we know exactly what you're saying. We are your workers. So Lord, we're asking for you to get a hold of us today and move us. Let us be the revival. Let us be the movement into this world to reach those who are curious and hungry for why we believe in Jesus Christ, why we follow you, why we go to church, why we grow, why we worship. Lord, move upon our hearts. May we see through this sermon today that we can do this. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's go to our original scripture for the day as well. Matthew chapter 28. We're going to be in verse 18. This is a staple anchor scripture for our church. We will reference it many times. You would see it in starting point or partnership class or anything like that. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, be on the screen for you as well. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We see here an order of what we can do to make disciples. Let me answer that question, what is a disciple? A disciple is a follower of Christ, and this, re- this implies that they have been converted. They have believed in Jesus Christ, and now they follow Christ, and they're a student or learner of Jesus, not just to be taught, but to live, to imitate the life of Christ. So that's what a disciple of Jesus is. I got news for you today. If you have believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he intended that you're a disciple of Jesus as well. I don't know if we really think about that too much in churches. I think we think about being Christians. I think we think about being believers, but we're to be disciples, learners of Christ, to go out and help other people. Excuse me. Ever since I had the communion, I've been messed up in my throat. I was thinking that wafer dried me out immediately. Man, that thing was like a sponge. (laughs) I need some fresh bread. That would be a lot of loaf of, that would be many loaves of bread in here. <laughs> so a disciple is someone who follows Christ, helps other people believe and follow Jesus. But what we see here is a progress of someone who doesn't just follow, but now they get water baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then we're to teach them to obey everything that God has commanded So they learned the commands in scripture, but you ready for this? One of the commands is to go make disciples. This scripture right here. So what happened then, church? Because this seems like a really good method authorized by Jesus himself. He gave authority to his apostles and disciples to go do this. He gave them power. He spent three and a half years spending quality time with them to show them how to do this. He wanted them to lead people to Christ and then water baptize them. And that was the starting line of the journey. That wasn't the end. Too often, you know what we see in churches? As soon as someone gets water baptized, they disappear. But guess what? We have to look at the church. We have to look at ourselves. Maybe, Maybe it's because we're not by them to help them continue the journey. Because it says next, teach these new disciples. That means you got to spend some time with some people. So what happened then? Why is there a decline in Christianity, but we see an increase in curiosity? Praise the Lord. Seems like God's waking people up in our world, right? Why is there a decline? Well, unfortunately, what we see, if you read books on this subject of making disciples, we see that, unfortunately, especially in America, not in other places, but in America, we split up evangelism and discipleship into two different arms. And Jesus was saying, no, 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 make disciples. You bring both of them together. So we don't just evangelize someone and lead them to Christ, although you can do that and you may never see that person again. 
Praise the Lord if they believe in Jesus. Praise the Lord. We, we, we hope that they would get water baptized somewhere. We hope that someone would teach them, but we wouldn't know. But what happened is um, evangelists and crusades would go around America and they would lead people to Jesus. But unfortunately, we found out from the Billy Graham crusades, many people gave their life to Christ. Some of you were evidence of that. Praise the Lord for that testimony. Many people walked away there too. And no one talks about that. In fact, they asked Billy Graham any regrets in his life. Do you know what he said? One of the things he would have done differently is he would have spent more time with 12 people like Jesus did. <clears throat> he said, I would have made more disciples instead of focusing on large crowds. Why? Because Jesus wanted us to reproduce him in people. Because Jesus didn't want us to use programs. He wanted us to move and change the world through people. Why is that? Because you can have a program once a year or two times a year or have six programs to bring people to the Lord, but guess what? You live 365 days. Come on. It sounds like you can make a disciple today, tomorrow, before church on Sunday. You can start telling people about Jesus. <clears throat> I should probably open up my notes, shouldn't I? No. What happened? Well, people would come into church, they would get evangelized, but the thing is they would come through events, they would come through crusades, but they had no one by them to disciple them. And so unfortunately, statistically, and this is done with research, the, the Southern Baptists found that they baptized like 7 million people, but when they went to go look at how many people they added to the church, they were in the negative. So where did they go? Well, Jesus had the answer for this. When Jesus started him, his ministry, you know what he started? He started a family. He started a small community of men. And women came too. He started a small group, a, a little mini church. Jesus invited people to be with him. And then he walked alongside and taught them. And he showed them. You know what I love about Jesus? He didn't just preach a sermon. He lived a sermon. Church, I'm, I'm, I'm challenged by this. I've read so many books on this, and they keep saying the same thing, that we can't rely just on the Sunday morning. We can't rely just on outreach events like our plays, which they all say we need to have those. But they need, they're saying that the church body, you and I, are to do this work together because that's 365 days times 2,000 people. Wow. The workers... Amen. The workers are few, but yet the harvest is great. And so he's, he's invited us to do life with him. He, he calls us to bring people in. So what, what am I talking about here? Well, let's, let's look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And I'm, it's not going to be on the screen. It's quite a bit of scripture. Let me show you how Jesus evangelized in a really simple way, but so did other people. His first disciples evangelized. And the first step of making disciples is to go out and reach those who are far from God. And this is what verse 35 says. Now, this is John the Baptist, okay? And John the Baptist has a few students himself. He has disciples who are following him, learning from him. And this is what it says. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, look, there is a lamb of God. In other words, the one who takes away the sins of the world, the great sacrifice who would die on the cross and take away the sins of the world. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Oh, he just lost two followers. No, he didn't. No, he actually, he, that was a benefit for them. And he was okay with it. He wanted to decrease so that Jesus would increase so Jesus looked around and saw them following, and Jesus was like, what are you doing? What do you want? They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And this is what Jesus says. He says, come and see. Oh, man, that's, that's pretty simple. That doesn't seem that very complicated, does it? It doesn't. Come and see. He didn't, he didn't say, you need to stop sinning right now, change your complete lifestyle right now, and then you can hang out with me. He said, come and see and hang out. Come and see. He was going to get there, 
But he said, just come and see. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying and they remained with him the rest of the day. That must have been an amazing day. Then it says this, Andrew, one of the ones, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew started evangelizing. You know what he did? He went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah. So what we see now is, John the Baptist knew Jesus, and because he knew about Jesus, he told two people that were following him about who he was. They decided to follow Jesus, and they hung out for Jesus for a day, and now they're, now Andrew is convinced that Jesus is the Messiah, the one that came to save the world, so now he's telling his brother Simon. Does that sound complicated, or does that just sound like a natural, just, just as natural, telling your friends who you found, telling your testimony? Praise the Lord. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. So this is the apostle Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, so now Jesus is back to fishing. He finds Philip, okay? And he says, come follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip now went to look for Nathanael and told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael, can anything good come from Nazareth? It wasn't much of a, <clears throat> it wasn't famous back then. There wasn't much there. What does Philip say? Come and see for yourself. Curiosity. Intriguing the Curiosity. As they approached, Jesus said, now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. How do you know about me, Nathanael asked. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Then Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. And Jesus goes on to say, did you believe because of this? Well, you'll do even greater things and you will see the son of man and the angels coming up and down. And I believe that was the ascension. Um, some of you may go, well, that was Jesus. I can't do that. Not true. The Holy Spirit gives you the power and supernatural gifts to have visions and dreams and words, uh, prophecy and knowledge and all these amazing gifts. You can be used just like that. You can be used just like that. What did we see here? We saw that relationships brought people to Jesus, that networks of relationships brought people to Jesus. Now, in the Bible, there's a Greek word. It's not, it's, it's the same as the yogurt, oikos. Oikos. And it means household. It means household. And what happened was, we find that the Christian movement exploded because of oikos. Yes, was there an amazing 3,000 person revival on Acts 2, the day of Pentecost? Yes. But what happened after that? Because there's millions of Christians. We find out through Christian history and, and books on the first and second century of Christianity that Christianity exploded through networks called oikos. What does that include? It means friends, family. At that time, the Romans had servants and also business associates and partners. And so what would happen was, and here there are some examples of this, but Cornelius got saved, and Cornelius' entire household believed because Cornelius believed. And then Lydia got saved, and now her entire household, even some of her business associates and friends got saved. And then Peter and Silas were in prison for their faith, for doing a miracle and, and preaching, and the jailer is afraid because God broke them out. And the jailer is about to take his own life because he knows he's already dead. And, and, and Paul's like, don't do that. Don't do that because... Uh, we were here. We didn't disappear. We're still here. And let us come to your house. And the jailer gets saved. So Paul and Silas lead the jailer to Christ. And guess what happens? It says that Oikos got saved. The entire household got saved. Why am I bringing this up? Because relational evangelism is key. You have an oikos. You have a sphere of influence. You have a society of people around you. They trust you. They, have, they, they see you and they love you and they respect you. 
And so when you get saved, they see a credible example of the gospel changing someone's life. That's really helpful when convincing skeptics whether this is real or not. So in other words, Jesus is saying, use the circles you already have. Go tell them about me. Help them, point them to Jesus. Now you're saying, Ryan, that you know, back then in John 1, they saw, they physically saw Jesus. So what do you mean? Well, tell them about Jesus and what he's done in your life. Point them to the scriptures over a cup of coffee or a Bible study time or invite them to one of our outreach events. Invite them to our play. Invite them on a Sunday morning. If 61% of young people are curious, why not bring them to church to hear this message today? That Jesus radically loves them. As we heard through the encouraging word that the Spirit was moving today, speaking through Angela. That God loves you. He's been chasing after you. We want our friends... I think that what's going on in our world is just birth pangs of something greater coming. I think if there's a time for this message to be preached, it's now. And I think what we're trying to learn today is to simplify making disciples. We we need people to not just evangelize, but to disciple. Not just to disciple, to go evangelize. Here's what I've seen happen in churches, is people get saved. No one's there to help them learn the scriptures and learn and watch how to do this, how to live, how to serve, how to give, how to do all these things for God, and so they end up leaving. Do you know why? Um, People just need connection. They need fellowship. They need support. They need examples. Jesus knew that, so he invited 12 people to spend time with him so he could show them what this looks like. He was doing a complete transfer of the kingdom of God, spiritually and physically, demonstrating how they should live. You know, people say uh, the best thing to do is not just to preach a sermon, but to show the sermon, to live it out. When you bring someone to Christ, guess who they have already to ask questions? You. Let's do a quick test. Let's say John 3, 16 together. Ready? For God... All right, you're good to go. That's the gospel in one verse, John 3, 16. Probably stated, you know, for various reasons, maybe not used properly in some context, unfortunately. But there's a powerful message in that scripture, isn't there? We had a young adult come into this this lobby one day, and if she's listening, I love her, praise the Lord. Hope she's still here. She came in, but she came by herself. And she had so many questions about what we were doing here. She had no idea, in other words, what church is. We live in a post-Christian and post-church world. People who left the church or never went to church are having children, and they're 18, 20 years old, and they have no idea what you're doing here right now. If they don't know what we're doing here, they probably don't know the meaning of John 3.16, and you know it inside and out, backwards and forwards. They just simply need someone to help explain that. They haven't heard of the first coming, and we're concerned for the second coming. But yet, Jesus has authorized and empowered you to go do this because you are a relational being. Even though some of you may not like to be too relational, and I get it, but you have a sphere of influence around you that is curious about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let me finish this up. Because it says, baptize them. So when we lead them to Christ, sometimes Jesus is going to save them without you even saying a word because he's already been working on them. But a lot of times we need to pray and confirm that decision with people, help them understand. And then the Bible says to baptize them. Why? Well, one, Jesus said to do that, but this is identification and sanctification. It's to identify with Christ that you are no longer your old life and you're new in Christ. To come out of that water, you're brand new. It's sanctify, meaning you're set apart and holy. You identify. But baptizing also has this message and meaning of being baptized or included into the family of God because you believed in Jesus. So we want to connect people into the church, the body, not the building, but the church, 
and help them grow. And that's the next part. It says, teach them to obey. Well, there's a lot of amazing things to obey. There's a lot of good things to do in the Bible. It's called godliness. And there's a lot of things we need to be careful to stay away from, holiness. And so now we're supposed to teach people to obey everything I've commanded them. So now we need to spend months, years at times. But here's the cool thing. Your, your friend who got saved or your family member or coworker who got saved, they have a story already. They can start telling their friends, you got to come see, you got to come see Jesus. You got to see what he's done in my life. They can start evangelizing at the front. And by the way, if you're wait till you're perfect, you're just going to have to go. You're never going to be perfect. I want to say that right now. Well, Ryan, I, I've, been, I've been training for 35 years. You got plenty of training. Trust me. It's plenty. Okay. So we baptize them. We teach them with our lives too. Our failures too at times. Right? Hey, I didn't do this very well. Let me help you with this area. Okay, here's how I pray. And you pray in front of them. The best way to learn how to pray isn't to read a prayer. It's to pray next to them, to pray with them. Show them how to read scripture. Show them what you've done in life. And then one of the commands is to go make disciples, to go reach the lost and help them meet Jesus and be saved. And then go through that process. And here's what I like to make sure I cover. Help them go make disciples so they can see how to do it again demonstrate it, because that's what Jesus did. Amen? Now, on teaching, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, this is the power of multiplication. How would the kingdom spread throughout the world? How would it change the world? Right here. This is Paul talking to Timothy. This is four generations of impact, because Paul got saved. Paul was the persecutor of the church. Paul was arresting Christians and having them persecuted and killed, and God got a hold of him and changed his life. He called himself the worst of sinners. He's saved, and now he has a disciple student. He has a disciple he's training to follow Christ. His name is Timothy, and this is what he tells Timothy. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. In other words, the gospel is credible. It's true. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Four generations of disciples. You and I are to be discipled so that we can be disciple makers. So when I preach on Sundays, I'm preaching with that mindset that this may be the only discipleship meeting you've gotten all week. So I'm going to make sure I teach and equip and train you on what scripture means and how to live. That's why we have groups. That's why we have Bible studies. That's why we have trainings on Wednesday nights and other times. That's why we have events like uh, VBSs for kids and, and youth camps. We're trying to train, but there's nothing greater than this because you can't always get together for a training, but we can always get together for a cup of coffee and pass some things down. And I'm passing these things on to my kids. I'm teaching in the truth of scripture to my children. Amen. I'm wearing a shirt that reminds me to make disciples. It's a so all may know shirt in our lobby right now. This is not a commercial, but you can take it as that way if you want. Um, but the reason why I'm bringing this up is because on my sleeve is the words reach, connect, grow, empower, go. God gave me these five words to help me. And I've been using these five words for the past two years in our church. I did not expect for the pandemic to throw such a wrench in the vision that God has. But you know what? God knows what he's doing. But one of the reasons why I've grieved the past two years about the mission of God to, to spread throughout the world is because we've been told to stay away from each other for two years. And yet the primary way that people are led to Christ is through relationship. Charles Arn and Wynne Arn said 75 to 90% of people who come to the faith is through relatives and friends. 75 to 90%. Uh, a doctor, I can't pronounce his name, I think he's like German or something, he did research on new believers. Those who came to the faith without anyone to help them more likely left, like five times more likely left, versus those who had someone who was brought to the faith through relationship. 
We don't, we don't want people to leave. I don't want you to be alone. I don't want you to be uneducated and not discipled. But I also don't want you to, to miss out on the joy of reaching people and evangelizing. What Jesus said to do when he said make disciples, he was making not just fully devoted followers, but fully developed, not perfect, but developed people who didn't know just how to evangelize, but they knew how to disciple and then show that person to go evangelize. That is the vision and dream of Calvary Church is that we're a disciple-making church. Why? Because that's what Jesus instructed us to do. So I'm going to encourage you to reach, to reach out to people around you and tell them, about Jesus. Show them the joy of serving you, of serving God. Show them the joy of worship. Show them, show them your life. Show them the love of Christ. <clears throat> You're going to get cards on the way out that have the acronym BLESS on it. It's a little strategy on being evangelistic. Reach, but don't just reach and then leave them hanging. Reach and connect them. Be there for them. Get their phone number. Or if they're coworkers, you know what's crazy is, is if it's your oikos, you already know them so well. They know, they know you're going to get a hold of them. And they can get a hold of you. So lead them to Christ. Help them make a decision to follow Christ, not just salvation, but follow Jesus. Connect them to a time with you to learn and to this church, right? Or some church, wherever they are. Help them grow teach and equip them, empower them to go. So reach, connect, grow, empower, go. You know who empowers us? The Holy Spirit. He gives us the power, but we also train and show people. So we empower them. We equip them to do things. And then we go and we make disciples. I guess I didn't need my notes after all. This is God's heart. This is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And he's, I think it's time, church. It's been time. It's been time to reverse the the trend and the tide of people not seeking God. And, And those who are curious that are seeking God, it's time for us to speak up and show them. And show them. While we stand together in prayer. My disciples, my fellow disciples, let's stand together. I want to encourage you to see yourself as a disciple of Christ. <clears throat> You're grateful for conversion, right? You're grateful for salvation. But now you've chosen to follow Jesus. And part of that journey means helping other people follow Jesus. God is going to give you the words to say. John three sixteen is a great scripture. Romans 5, 8 is a great scripture. Know your word. I, one thing I need to make sure you understand is, You have to be a disciple in order to make disciples, right? The word disciple literally means in the Bible, learner or student of Christ. We we do. The more we learn and know, the more confident we will be when when connecting with people. But I love the Holy Spirit because he fills in the gaps and the things that we don't have. He's going to do that for you too. People are ready. Other research shows that 70 some percent of people want to know why your faith matters. It's from a book called You Found Me. It's there. People are hungry. And this world, this world is making people uncomfortable and it's starting to make them look up. You have the answer. It's Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this message. Thank you for your holy word. God, we see your burden in Matthew 9 that your heart broke and had compassion for those who are lost and wandering. God, break ours like yours. God, give us eyes to see and may we put our feet to work and go to them and love them. Lord, thank you for your plan of making disciples and God, we wanna be a part of the whole journey, not just the first part, not just the second or the third, but we wanna help them go make disciples. So God, we thank you for that. And your word says in the end, that you will be with us until the very end of the age. That's a promise for whoever makes disciples. Thank you, God, that you go with us. Lord, be with us. Be with our world. <clears throat> I, I lift up the, the Evans family, Blue who, and Jensen Reed, who, who 
who passed away this, a few days ago, just, just about 10 days ago, Lord, in a tragic accident. Lord, bring comfort to the families, to the friends and the schools. God, be with us as we do this funeral. Be with Pastor Jody and Pastor Kuhn as they've been asked to do this funeral here at this church. God, I pray, Lord, that you would use us to minister to these students in these schools. God, be with our, our the Beckfords, Lord, Donovan Beckford, who passed away on us, Lord, and, and the cancer took over, Lord. And, and God, I thank you for his faith. Thank you, God, that he believed for a healing, but he also believed for your will to be done. What great faith. Thank you, Lord. It takes faith for both. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for that man of God he was. Lord, help us as we do his service in the coming weeks. And Lord, again, we lift up Ukraine and Russia. We, we pray, God, that you would change President Putin's heart. God, we ask that you would humble him, that he would drop his pride and he would pull back his troops. God, that he would see that this was a mistake and that he would bring restitution and rectify the issues, God. Lord, we know that you can control the hearts of kings and kingdoms because you're the Lord of the universe. So Lord, do that today. <clears throat> God, we think about these Russian soldiers who are just doing what they're being told to do. And I'm sure some of them don't want to do this. God, I pray for them. Help them, Lord. God, lives are being lost, God. So we pray, Lord, for the Ukrainians who are being, who, are, who have a target on their bodies, Lord, that, Lord, you would protect them. Lord, intervene in that situation right now in Jesus' name. Thank you for the bravery and the courage of the citizens and the president. Lord, we thank you for them, God. And Lord, I pray that they would feel your presence and your peace, Lord, and you would show a way through this tragic event. Lead and guide us, Lord, in our prayers for everyone involved including our leaders and our world leaders. Lord, we need a move. And God, we move from this pew to our community. And now we open up our lives to show what Jesus has done and who he is according to your scriptures. We love you, God. We praise you and we thank you for this service. In Jesus' name, amen.